Hello everyone, welcome aboard the Mickey and Friends tram to the D23 Disney Character Voices presentation. Please follow your head, watch your step, and... Oh, wait, 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 um, that's, that's not, that's not doing it for me. Can, can we, um, can we try something maybe a, a, with a little more weight to it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Alas, uh, it be too late to all to call this. Sit closer to them and mark them mark well the words. It is dead men tell no tales. Um, I guess we're just a little too piratey. Um, can we maybe try it? Maybe something more mysterious? Oh, sure. <coughs> Welcome to the show. Your ghost host. <laughs> Kindly step all the way in, please, and make room for everyone. There's no turning back now. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Uh, that's, that's good. That's not um, so scary for, for this presentation. So, why do you do what you want to do? Go for it, Corey. All right. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, live from Anaheim, California, welcome to the Disney Character Voices 30th Anniversary Celebration, with special appearances by some of our favorite Disney voice talents. And now, please welcome the Senior Vice President of Character Voices, Rick Dempsey! Take all the nerves out. This is a big crowd. So, hey, thanks for joining us for our 30th anniversary celebration of Disney Character Voices. We are thrilled to have you. I think we're going to have a blast as we take you behind the magic curtain a little bit of how character voice work is created. In fact, we have so much lined up today that I'm afraid we might go a little long, so I hope that's okay with you. But before we go too far, I'd like to wax a bit nostalgic and talk briefly about the history of Disney character voices. There are obviously hundreds and hundreds of incredibly talented actors who have created our characters over Disney's 90-year history. But the fact of the matter is, and I know we say it often, but it all started with just one. That's right, Mickey Mouse. Giving a cartoon character a voice in the late 1920s was an achievement so remarkable that it's what paved the way for the future of the Walt Disney Company. When Walt created Mickey and stepped up to the microphone to give him a voice, he essentially became the first character voice actor ever. That's why today we value our character voices so much because it was essentially what helped start the company making cartoon characters talk. But now let's jump back uh, a little over 30 years ago to the mid-1980s. The company was experiencing incredible growth and success. Roy Disney was chairman of animation and vice chairman of the company, and he knew that the consistency and integrity of our character voices and personalities was absolutely key to ensuring that they maintained their ongoing appeal. But at the time, the company didn't have an official voice department, so, here to talk about how he started one, the founder and first employee of this newly created division, Les Perkins. Welcome to Thanks. To simplify, the seed for Disney character voices was planted in a project for Disneyland. While working at Imagineering, Tony Baxter asked me to produce all the audio for the new Fantasyland renovations of 1983-84. This ended up leading me down a path of exploring the entire company's use of established characters. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing that was all started by a mouse. Mm -hmm.
Quiet now, watch out. Hurry up, Pluto. Hang on, pal. Here we go. Shh, Pluto. You don't want to get torn off, do you? fun and fancy free, Walt realized he was too busy to always provide Mickey's voice. So he asked the studio's sound effects wizard, Jimmy McDonald, to take over the voice duties, and both of them are on that soundtrack. By the 1970s, it was time to pass the torch once again. And as it happened, Jimmy had a sound effects apprentice who had additional talents. Wayne Being trained by Jimmy, Wayne voiced Mickey for the new Mickey Mouse Club in 1977 and Mickey's Christmas Carol in 1983, as well as a few other projects, but not all of them. When it came to Donald Duck, Tony Anselmo had actually studied under Donald Duck's voice creator, Clarence Nash. Tony learned that unique sound perfectly, recording several projects. But there were still at least four other people performing Donald in other parts of the company who did not sound like our cherished character. Again, proving the very obvious need for voice consistency. Now, while working on an unrelated project, I heard a demo tape from a talented lady with a charming, naturally high-pitched voice. I noted her name for future reference, and her name was Rusey Taylor. <laughs> of course, our beloved Rusey became the perfect choice for our beloved man. And then, while still at Imagineering, I found the amazing Bill Farmer through a blanket audition I, I just put out a, a, a call to all of the industry voiceover agencies. Now, Bill had just moved here from Texas only four months earlier. Timing is everything, right? When, when I later met with Roy Disney, he concurred, Bill is goofy. <laughs> Thus, Roy made this the official casting of the gang. model sheets so that the characters can always look the same, but there was no audio equivalent. So, in October 1986, I wrote a memo to Roy Disney proposing a central operation to oversee and protect the consistency of these important personalities through good casting and scripting and direction across all parts of the company. Roy wrote back the same day, saying, I appreciate your memo more than I can tell you. It's a subject that's worried me a great deal, too. So, there were lots of discussions, analyses, administrative issues to work out, etc. But finally, a year later, with Roy championing the cause, 
He got CFO Frank Wells to authorize this new operation. Now, even I didn't realize the extent to which the various main and minor characters were being used throughout Disney. In the first year alone, as a one-person department, I ended up casting 119 soundalikes. Soundalikes, when the original voice actors aren't available, which is always the first choice. I quickly began campaigning for an assistant to help meet the demands of all the character-driven projects in which the company was involved. But that position was finally approved after 10 months. Now, I needed a person who could hit the ground running. So, I called in someone I would worked well with on a previous project. Guess who? And here he is, because it's his 30th anniversary too. Come on up, Rick. <laughs> so as Les explained, the company now um, had our official characters cast. One story I always like to tell, and some of you already know this, but once Wayne was cast as Mickey, and then Rusi was cast as Minnie, the two were constantly working in the studio together. They had a great chemistry between them as they performed the voices, but they also had a little bit of chemistry of a personal nature, if you know what I mean. And as they ultimately fell in love, they got married. So, dinner at their house was very, very interesting, let me tell you. <laughs> and to show you the kind of fun the two had together, um, I have a clip here that no one has really seen. It took place in our offices back in 1989 at a small holiday gathering. So, this is 30 years ago, and this is Wayne Allwine and Lucy singing together at our office Christmas party from 1989. Now, this was supposed to be a condensed clip, and somehow we got our technical thing mixed up and they got the full length version, so it's three minutes long. I think we're gonna cut it somewhere in the me middle. You're gonna get an idea of it. But this is Wayne and Rusi perform performing at our little office Christmas party. Enjoy this. All right, All right. Well, I, I'm Rick with Character Voice Department. And then we're gonna have a Wayne on White and Rusi Taylor, who are the voice of Minnie and Mickey Mouse, um, come out and sing a little number for you. Let's see what we tune that we've worked out. It's sort of Mickey and Minnie as they sang together many, many years ago. Uh, it's not a Christmas number. It's a combination of two old-time numbers. Uh, five foot two and Sunday. Uh, both of which are very appropriate for the season. Uh, so, are we ready, Minnie? I'm ready. Say, uh, Minnie, I got a little song for you. Oh, you Yeah, I hope you like it. I can sing all the time. Here goes. Think I get choked up here, but 
Glass Rusi. My wife will say, I know you were going to get choked up. <laughs> They're certainly missed and uh, they both leave a legacy to build on for the future. So in 2009, we were lucky enough to find a wonderful guy who sounded incredibly close to Wayne's Mickey. He was working at a, as an illustrator at Hallmark in Kansas City, of all places. Kansas City? Yes. Oh, fellas, I think that's our cue. Gorms, you yeah, know, we're supposed to be on stage now. Look, it's Mickey, Donald, and Goofy, Brett Island, Bill Farmer, and Tony and Selma. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I thought I was going to get through it. I really did. So, so Tony, um, Les mentioned that you studied directly from um, Dutch. You want to tell us about that experience? How'd you meet him? Well, I was already on the lot as an animator in traditional animation. Uh, at that time, we were working on Mickey's Christmas Carol. And Wayne was Mickey, and we were pals. He was in sound effects. And Clarence Nash was always on the lot, and I struck up a friendship with him, and he kind of corny phrase, took me under his wing, and um, I didn't, I thought we were just having fun, he would come in my room and say, well, if Donald were in this situation, what would he say? Or if Mickey said that, what would Donald say? Say this word, say that word, and I thought, he must be bored. <laughs> but I think he had a, a, what we didn't know at the time was he had leukemia. He didn't tell anybody. And so looking back on it, I think it was just that he was making sure that I could do it and that I would be respectful of his legacy. And uh, when he passed away, then um, I carried the torch. So I'm very protective of it, as, as we all are. It's, but it's not an easy voice to do. How long did it take you to really kind of master it? It was really about three years, you know? Yeah. It, it comes in stages, the sound, and then what you say and what you don't say, the personality is as, as much uh, import, of as much importance as how it sounds. And you kind of help write the scripts because it is so hard to understand Donald, right? Yeah, and, and that's just, it's like learning another language. You know, how to, <laughs> and, and, you know, you can't teach everybody in the company that language. It's like learning a very exotic language. So I have to go over the script and just take the same word that they want to use and get out the thesaurus and find a word with hard consonants instead of soft consonants to, to make it as intelligible as possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. And so, Bill, um, Les also mentioned that you were new to town when you uh, got the role of Goofy. Yeah. Um, what brought you to this whole like voice audition, and, and how did you end up even auditioning for the voice of Goofy? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, I was a stand-up comic in Dallas, Texas at the time. My agent there said you ought to give it a shot in Hollywood with all the voices you do. Because I'd always bored my parents and family with impressions throughout my career. And I got out here, and about four months later, my agent said, do you do any of the Disney characters? They wanted to consolidate the voices, so there was always one voice, so there was consistency. And I said, "Gosh, I can try to do a goofy voice. And they seem to like that a lot. <laughs> And running. I, 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 so I started January 23rd, 1987 was my first goofy job, and it's been uphill ever since. <laughs> you, you always just tell us that as a kid you used to sit in front of the TV and, and just imitate things like Captain Crunch. And oh, I would. I would, you know, oh, hi, ladies, it's Captain Crunch cereal. Stays crunchy, but no. Hey, rookie, what's me bully rabbit out of my head? <laughs> Hi ho, Cookie Frog here on this Mickey. <laughs> Just do any kind of voice I could. Access, stage love. <laughs> and you also do Pluto for us, right? Oh, absolutely. Pluto, uh, I can bark actually in all languages. <laughs> for example, in English, it's what? You know, in German, it's what? In French, it's what? <laughs> well, speaking of Pluto in all languages, you remember we had a project early on, had just started, and um, we couldn't find, I think some of you saw the clip reels that we played earlier on, 
Um, that's also another aspect of Disney character voices where we try to uh, get all the characters to sound the same around the world no matter what language they speak. And we could not find a German goofy. We just couldn't. So we said we had some cartoons that we had to put into German, and so we had Bill come into the studio to, to do the German version phonetically. So, oh, and I, I, I don't speak German. So they got me this professor of German from, I believe, USC, who I don't think had ever seen a cartoon in her life. <laughs> He was like looking at the cartoon and says, Why does Goofy fall out, out of the airplane? He's not killed. But he's... <laughs> so it was like a 12 hour session, as I remember. It was, Boy, and boy, you know, drunk. And as I understand it, I asked a, a few months later, What happened to the German thing that we did? And they said, Well, it was pretty good, but you had an Austrian accent. <laughs> And the German professor was from Austria. I had picked up her accent, so they couldn't use it. <laughs> so, and, and I will say one thing about Bill. If you know, some of you who may know Bill, Bill truly is goofy in real life. Yes. <laughs> he, he really is. Um, we have, have had experiences. Uh, I think one of my favorites is when he went to go set a Coke down on the soundboard and it started yes. to tip. And, yeah, and uh, I think there's a goofy curse that goes along with his voice. <laughs> And one day I was in the studio and I had a Coca-Cola and I sat it down on the edge of the, the mixing board. And, but I didn't put it down solid. It was like half on, half off. It started to fall. I grabbed it. I hit the neck. The bottle started spinning, <laughs> spewing Coke all over a probably couple of hundred thousand dollar audio board. <laughs> Engineers are going, ah! <laughs> Goofy follows me around and, all the time. And you had a little goofy moment just here at D23? Oh, I, I did the other day. I was at the Legends Luncheon, and I was saying hi to Catherine Beaumont, the original voice of uh, Wendy and Peter Pan and Alice in Alice in Wonderland. We were talking, and I backed up and went, oh, ran into someone. And he said, well, watch out. And I looked up, and it was Bob Iger. <laughs> I'm going, sorry, sir. <laughs> He's got a great sense of humor, and uh, he's still here, so. He's got a broken toe now, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, and, and so, Brett, this is 30th anniversary for Disney Character Voices, but you're a 10-year anniversary, right? Yeah, You've been doing the voice hard to believe. That's right. But what have these 10 years been like for you? I mean, uh, getting the gig of Mickey Mouse, come on. <laughs> I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, in some ways, it's it's flown by. In other ways, it's hard to believe that it's been ten years. I feel like I've had a lot of amazing experiences. Um, I've I've learned a ton. I'm still learning a ton. And um, but overall, it's just it's it's incredible. I'm, I'm still kind of it's a, it's a surreal experience for sure. What's the hardest thing about doing Mickey's voice? <sighs> the hardest thing is that it's a trick voice and. Uh, I, I'm highly susceptible to allergies and air quality and smog and where do we work? Here in LA. So, uh, you know, I moved from Kansas City where apparently the air was a little cleaner then and, and I was slightly younger. So over the years I've learned that, um, yeah, I have to be really vigilant with the weather and, and, and the, you know, different things I'm being affected with. So it takes its toll. And, and you told so me you just visited the doctor, um, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. I thought that yeah. was a pretty funny story when they were looking down your throat. <laughs> yeah, uh, first of all, they, they did one of those scope things where you can look at your vocal cords, which was just fascinating to me to see those things work and vibrate. Um, and, and she had me do the, you know, talking a falsetto and even had me do the Mickey lap. She wanted to see how it was affected. And uh, she was done, she said, hey, everything looks healthy, you just got a little inflammation, you know, probably from, from allergies and stuff. She goes, man, you know, most women can't hit those notes, so you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> I'm not sure that was the diagnosis I was looking for, but then <laughs> But that's what we like. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Great. So for all three of you, you guys can just take your turns. Did you um, share a moment um, with being such a famous character? Was there ever a very special moment, a personal experience, maybe with a fan um, from the years that you've been doing the voice? You want to start? Yeah, actually, just start right. Go for it. Go for it. Let's start. Um, I think this counts. Um, it, it was an experience with my brother, but he's a fan. Uh, but, um, my, you know, I really learned to uh, do the Mickey voice by listening to Wayne Allwine's performance in Fantastic. It was one of my favorite shows growing up. I was, ten, I think, 10 years old when it came out, listened to the soundtrack all the time. And, you know, Bill talks about singing in front of the TV and imitating voices. I imitated all the characters in Fantastic. 
and I would play Phantasmic in my bedroom. And later on, my brother joined me, and we would play Phantasmic out in the yard. We'd have, we'd have the, the, the sprinklers going, and you know, he'd be running back and forth between the hoses. And we'd play the soundtrack, of course, and uh, my dad had a work projector, and we would uh, project Fantasia, Sorcerer Apprentice, into the water to try to get We were a high tech. Um, we even got some fireworks, you know, we were living in Illinois at the time, we'd go across to Missouri, get fireworks, and shoot off bottle rockets. I think we forced my parents to sit and watch us put on the show. Anyway, it was just, you know, that's, it was quintessential Disney to me, it's, it's like, it, it, it represented everything I loved about Disney magic, and especially the performance of Mickey, so I, I just kind of imitated that over the years. Fast forward to a couple years ago, I, I think a lot of you probably got to go, there was a, they, we updated Fantasmic. Um, and I was asked to come into the studio to do Fantasmic, and I assumed it was for Tokyo or something. I'd done stuff before like that. But they told me, no, it's Disneyland. And I was actually hesitant. I didn't want to do it, you know, but they explained that there was enough changes that it was necessary. And they had even said that there was a uh, possibility that we're going to leave Wayne's finale line, some imagination, as Wayne, as a tribute. And I was all for that. I thought that'd be amazing. They had me record it anyway. Um, and uh, then they did special preview nights for the D23 folks here at the last expo. My invitation was lost in the mail. I was not invited. But <laughs> my brother and I found a way into the parks, and we, we watched from the sidelines over by um, Big Thunder Mountain. And um, watching the show, and it was pretty cool. And you're like, wow, that's crazy. I get to be a part of this thing that was so important to me as a, when I was a kid. And the finale line came, and they ended up using my report for some imagination. And my brother put his hand on my shoulder and said, did you ever think that when we were kids, playing Fantasmic, that someday you would be a part of all this. And that's, you know, probably one of the most impactful moments. It's a total full circle and it really humbling for me and just, you know, it's one of those moments where you go, this is incredible. I cannot believe this. That's awesome. Really? <laughs> Over the years, I've, I've discovered on how important these characters are to people in their lives. Uh, and that's meeting the fans, because so many people have come up, say, from a goofy movie, and people would say, I couldn't talk to my dad. <laughs> and they would say, I couldn't talk to my dad until we saw that movie, and it opened up a whole new relationship. Um, I, I was in Florida once, and occasionally you get to meet celebrities who are enamored of these characters. I got to meet Muhammad Ali once and at a uh, party and he asked me i said oh i do the voice for the company and everything and he says well do you talk to like kids in the hospitals and i say yeah i'll make wish foundation uh, you know famous phone friends organizations like that and he goes man then you're my hero and i just fainted right there <laughs> uh but the most probably meaningful uh event was a wayne and rusey moment there was a child that i believe had leukemia that called wanted to talk to mickey and many, and I was doing Pluto at that time on that particular call. And, uh, you know, the girl was, we heard from her mom, he, he, uh, she was uh, resisting treatment, had a bad outlook, was kind of failing. And Wayne said, gosh, you know, when, uh, when Pluto takes his medicine, he feels a lot better. And I go, whoa, whoa, you know. And just that, about a month or two later, we got a, a letter from the woman who said that because of that talking to Mickey the child's uh, whole attitude changed she went into remission and was willingly taking the, the therapy and got better that alone just showed me how important these characters are and I never try and forget that when I'm doing this voice I like to take it back to, because I'm all about legacy, you know? I'm all about the history of these characters, and that we're really only carrying on what came before us as best we can. And, and uh, you just reminded me of the uh, time we were at. Wayne was so, he, he was never about himself, it was always about his audience and the kids and the performance. And there was a little boy who hadn't bought what he was supposed to buy to sign, and the person who was running the event said, you can't have that signed. And, and the kid started to cry and run away. And Wayne got up and went after him and signed his thing. I just thought that was sweet. And, and Clarence, in, um, speaking about legacy, I went with Clarence Nash to across the street from Disney to St. Joseph's Hospital. And there was a, a little girl who was crying. She had her tonsils out. And the nurse said, she's 
she's going to hurt herself if she doesn't stop. And Clarence had his uh, duck puppet, and he went up to the little girl and said, Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> she did. <laughs> We could tell stories for, for hours, but um, I think maybe what you guys would like to hear is maybe to do the voices. Yeah. So um, we're going to step over to our little mock recording studio over here, so if you guys want to go on over there. And uh, we've got a special script written specifically for D23 with these guys, but every good script needs a, uh, a villain. So in our script today, we've written in the game's constant nemesis. So please welcome to the stage, the voice of Pete, he's got really great sexy legs. Check this out, the one and only Jim Cummings. Hello there. I love Jim, you got the shorts on, he's looking good. <laughs> Hey, it's All right. Yeah. Well, look at that little cat. Easy goofy. Easy goofy. Please. <laughs> okay. Well, we're ready to do this. All right. Here we go. So really, my job in the studio as director, this is what I get to do. All I really do. This guy's so phenomenal. I just say, take one. Go. Come <laughs> Alice. We're at the D twenty three Expo. Gorge. The way said folks are gonna want to take pictures with us and get our autographs. <laughs> Well, uh, where do you think we should set up, Mickey? Huh, um, uh, how about over here? Uh, this looks like a good spot. Out of my way, you yardsticks. That primo table is mine. <laughs> yeah, Pete, we spotted that table first. Pointers, keepers, baby. Yeah, well, you losers are gonna be weepers. On account of because my fans deserve to see me in the best light and at the biggest table. After all, I need lots of space for my piles of pictures and foam fingers and signature bobbleheads and whatnot. Oh, uh, well, uh, I guess we can set up over in this corner, pals. Okie dokie, well, I got the table. And I've got our markers and our pictures. And we're going to rest the book well, uh, the crowd should be here any minute. Oh, hey, what's the matter, boys? Not popular enough? Or is everybody just here to see me? Ah, <laughs> uh, don't listen to him, guys. I'm sure we'll get lots of fans real soon. <laughs> uh, um, hmm. Huh. Gosh, I wonder how come nobody's stopping by to take our pictures. Well, uh, do you think maybe we should have worn our Kingdom Hearts costumes? <laughs> yeah, I tried, but security wouldn't let me in with my keyblade. Oh, <laughs> come on now, folks, stand back, don't push for the line. You the all get your photos and autographs. And don't forget to purchase up a bottlehead or ten. <laughs> no need to look at the knuckleheads over in the corner. Nothing to see there. <laughs> what? Oh, I'm gonna go get Pete a piece of my mind. Hey, Petey, it's wah, 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 wah. You mean you want me to fall again? Yeah! And Donald, throw another tantrum. Everybody seems to love it! Ha, <laughs> ha,
the good Lord. So, well, so Jimmy, you and I met, I was working on a show before Disney called The Real Ghostbusters, mm. and you came in to do um, the voice of a haunted mailbox. And um, I remember thinking, this guy's really, really good. And I said, hey, Jim, what, uh, what else do you have going on? And you told me that you had just been cast, this is 1985-ish, uh, uh, for the new TV animation series, The New Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Is that right? <laughs> Cast the cast of the voice too. Yes, it is, Mr. Dempsey. <laughs> I was ever so grateful that you made sure that there was plenty of honey written into my contract. <laughs> uh, the original voice of Pooh was Sterling Holloway, and uh, Jimmy told us a story about how you had a chance running with Sterling. You want to tell us that? Yes, it, it was kind of fun. It was years before I was even in the business down in Laguna Beach with my wife, and uh, we were having, having lunch, and we thought we were the only people in the diner, and we see the waitress go over, and uh, she says, well, have we decided what we're going to have for lunch? And you hear this little voice, I believe I shall have the chow dog. <laughs> and I was thinking, shouldn't he have said honey? <laughs> I got up and looked, and sure enough, it was Sterling Holloway, and no, I didn't go up and say hello to him like uh -oh. a dork. I had no idea I'd be up here, so forgive me. <laughs> but it was fun. That's awesome. And, and you've also been performing the voice of Tigger for us as well, right? Well, you might be known as something there, but I can't do any bones in here on account of because the feelings are so low. <laughs> are kind of sound-alike voices, we call them, as Les mentioned, where um, we have the original voice and, of course, are sound-alikes. And, um, but Jim has created so many original characters for us. In fact, one of the most recent originals, and I just found this out myself just a couple okay. days ago, is that in the new attraction, um, Smuggler's Run, Hondo, <laughs> Any Star Wars fans? No? Come on, what's the sound like? Well, in that case, you all get to go to the front of the line. <laughs> and it will only cost you... Mm, I'll let you know. <laughs> That's a great point. I'm there all night, my buddy. Thank you. Thank you. But then I bet you we got a few fans here of another one of your original characters, Darkwing Duck. <laughs> I am the terror who flaps in the night. I am the winged scourge who packs at your nightmares. I am Darkwing Duck. Of all these characters, the hundreds of characters that you've done, do you have a favorite? Well, I do. One, one that's very, very close to my heart. They're, they're kind of, it's kind of crowded at the top. But I gotta tell you one thing. You know them women love a man with a big man. Don't make me like my butt. Hey, <laughs> Jim Cummings, everyone. We have a number of actors who perform multiple voices for us, so I'd like to bring back to the stage the multi-talented, multi-voiced, and incredibly versatile, the one and only Corey Burton. We all love this guy, huh? Come on. So um, these guys are amazing. So I've asked our DCD script writer, Renee Johnson, to see if she could put together a script featuring some of the many voices of both Jim and Corey. So are you guys ready for that? <laughs> so, Corey, you're going to start us off with a voice that we all know, a sound alike, from the very first animated feature ever. So here we go. You ready? Let's do it. What wouldst thou know? What is it that you see? Ask not about the future, of that I cannot speak. Oh, fine. Well, then say something about the man cub. Where is that delicious man cub? Over the seven jeweled hills, beyond the seventh fall, in the jungle of the fragrant flowers, dwells the man cub. 
smaller stock than the hall. No, you can't be serious. Fragrant flowers always irritate my sinuses. Sinuses? <laughs> Hello there. Allow me to introduce myself, Professor Ludwig von Drake himself, here to tell you all about the latest scientific breakthrough for that miserable case of the fooies you are suffering with the schnoody on the snaky sinuses, with the sniffle sneezy reaction to common pollinating flower allergy symptoms you get over there. Well, it's not a problem anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks to Dr. Ludwig's new and improved special snake sinus desensitizing super spray patent pending. It'll blast out those impacted sinuses like a great big fire hose. Money back guaranteed. Order yours today from me. Hey, 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 now. Maybe I need some of that for my grandma Ma. You know she got us decent agilities like ain't nobody business. And when she let out one of that big achoo! You know a big glowing bug gonna light up to buy you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, and you cook your little buck, you. When in the world did you get here, all right? Oh, you know me, I'm just passing through on my way to meet my bell, Evangeline. The sweetest fire flying all creation. Ha! <laughs> fly. Nothing but flying gnats, if you ask me. Give me a pickle jar and I'll use them for a hurricane lamp. Oh, whoa, 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 you talking about capturing my girl? That's it. Put him up. I'm gonna make dewberry pie out you. Pie? Oh, oh, my goodness, me. <laughs> that must mean it's time for tea. Clean cup, clean cup, move down, move down, move down. Well, I could move down, but I rather like floating up here. Of course, I can always disappear as well. Disappear? Oh, <laughs> don't let's be silly now. How can we celebrate your own birthday if you're only going to disappear, you know? <laughs> oh, we got good. Um, I noticed in the script we've got uh, a little bit with Alice and the Queen of Hearts. But unfortunately, the actresses who do those characters couldn't make it today, so I thought it would be fun if we found some audience members who could play the Queen of Hearts and Alice for us. So, is there anyone in our audience that wants to give a shot at the Queen of Hearts? <laughs> so I've got Brian Monroe and Rich Mayfeldon from our group. You want to start over here? Okay, all right, we got a really loud person over here. So <laughs> Alright, so what's your name? What's your name? I'm Shay. Shay? Yeah. Okay, Shay. Alright, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do like we normally do our sound alike casting. So we're gonna play a little bit of the reference. So if we can play the reference here, Shay. Sounds like this. Who's been painting my roses red? Oh, with their head! <laughs> Who's been painting my roses red? Off with her! on this side over here. Brian, who do you have? We've got Golden here. What, what, what is it? Golden. 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 Love it. Okay, let's, so let's play the reference again for you. Who's been painting my roses red? Oh, with their head! All right, let's hear it, Golden. Who's been painting my roses red? Off with their heads! Good. Thumbs up, thumbs down. I, I, I like them both, but I think we're going to go with Shay here. Okay. Okay. Stay right there, Shay. Now we need an Alice, so I need someone who's got a young British accent. Okay. <laughs> Can you find that person, Brian Richmond? All right, what do you got here? Come on out. Stay there, Shay. We have Julia. Okay. This is Julia. All right, Julia, here's the reference of Alice. Oh, darling. It's just a rabbit with a waistcoat. Curiouser and curiouser. All right, let's hear it. A little British accent. No, Dinah. It's just a rabbit with a waistcoat. Curiouser and curiouser. All right, good. Good. All right, Brian, what do you have over there? Alyssa. Alyssa. Okay, 
great. Let's hear it, Alyssa. We'll play the, want to hear the reference? Yeah, she wants to reference. She's a pro. <laughs> oh, darling. It's just a rabbit with a waistcoat. Curiouser and curiouser. Oh, Dinah, it's just a rabbit with a waistcoat. Curiouser and curiouser. Good right. that up and sound like a 12 year old, you never know. So why don't you come on up, Alyssa? And why don't you come up, Shay? Shay? All right, so. <laughs> All right, hold on, no autographs right now. I'm not doing that right now. All right. So uh, we are going to continue with our little script. So you guys get to join Jim. You're going to be in the middle of mic right there. Yep, there you go. And uh, we actually start off with the Queen of Hearts. So Queen of Hearts, take it from there. Do you see your line right there? I think it's a highlighted line there. Okay. All right, All right. here we go. And take it, Shay. Off with her head! Oh, I'm not afraid of the open. <laughs> <laughs> call us take two. Here we go. that you are a pompous, bad-tempered, old tyrant. <laughs> Off with her head! Explain yourself. Who are you? Why, I'm Alice. Stop! That is not spoken correctly. It is Alice. No, I'm quite certain that it's A different plan for her. So now, Lydia, if you and your incorrigible band of lost boys would be so kind, it is time to walk the plank! <laughs> so, okay, hold on. Uh, in our script, it calls for Wendy, and as we all know, Catherine Beaumont voiced both Wendy and Alice. And so, since we've already cast her as Alice, why don't you continue, Alyssa? You can take out Wendy's line there. Okay. <laughs> we will not walk the plank. Peter Pan will save us! <laughs> Peter Pan will save us! Well, Peter Pan is about to be blasted out of Neverland forever! No. Not on my watch, Buster! I am the terror that flaps in the night! I am the wicked scourge that pecks at your planks! Or your poop deck, whichever's funnier. I am Duckwing Duck! Now, what seems to be the trouble here? Grammar? No trouble I am seeing with my little eyes over here. Unless you're talking about the funny business going on with the floating Chester cats and fancy pants pirates and all those other kooky characters and bucks we got around here. But, with so many fine feathered folks gathered together already, it is my scientific humble opinion that we should forget about all this yelling and terrible pirate hooey going on and get ourselves back to the fun having, would you? Now you're talking my language, child. <laughs> Word has grabbed my royal ear that you folks might know the secret to man's red fire. Crazy. <laughs> The dog told me I'll be. I reached the top and had to stop. But that's what's gonna remain. I wanna be a man, man. Let's go right into town and be just like the other men. I'm tired of walking around. Bigger than they do, they do. I wanna be like you. I wanna war. Yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> A powerful 
But mention it is not to be trifled with or taken lightly. Truly consider what you wish for. Now, my wish for all of you, may your heart be your guiding key. Characters are voiced by very young actors. I'll tell you guys from fan club over there, right here. <laughs> characters like Pinocchio, Bambi, Thumper, Christopher Robin, Rue, Nemo, and Chip from Beauty and the Beast all have specific voices that brought those characters to life. The problem is, those kids grow up, and we have to recast them every few years. So DCB was asked by the filmmakers of Tarzan to try and come up with a voice for this little guy. So we were super fortunate to find a little four-year-old um, to give him a super unique voice. So let's take a look at this. Mom! <laughs> Mom! Are you sure this water sanitary? It's questionable to me. It's fine, honey. Yeah. But what about bacteria? Tantor, can't you see mommy's talking? There's a little bit of nepotism going on because that was actually my son, Caleb. <laughs> and he just happens to be here today somewhere in the audience. Aren't you here, Taylor? <laughs> so Taylor's now 26 and he's very thankful he doesn't still sound like that. <laughs> So one of our most recent lead roles by a young actor is Miguel from Pixar's <laughs> Pixar. So the Pixar team found a wonderful actor who's with us today. Please welcome the voice of Miguel from Pixar's Coco, Anthony Gonzalez. casting for, for Miguel because my voice changed but I actually found out that they casted my little brother Alex and you know, that was so cool. <laughs> Keeping it in the family, right? Yes. Isn't that fun? So, um, I tell you what, we got something pretty special. You look like you're dressed up to do some kind of like singing or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. Yeah, I thought it would be super fun for me to sing Remember Me but for the first time ever with my little brother Alex. Miguel Anthony Gonzalez singing with his sound alike, his brother Alex Gonzalez, and the Mariachi Divas. Until you're in my arms again, remember. 
Enterprising young woman who dreamed of bringing folks together by opening her own restaurant. And when she was almost there, she made a wish on the evening star. The woman who taught us that dreams do come true when you make them happen. Please welcome the voice of Tiana, the brilliant Disney legend, Anika Nubi Rose. Now, she dreamed of seeing life beyond the palace walls and stood up to a snake of a villain. Soaring high in the sky to a whole new world, it's the voice of Jasmine, the fabulous Disney legend, Linda Larkin! Next, she stole our hearts as the provincial girl who wanted more than to have every day be like the day before. In fact, she wanted an adventure in the great wide somewhere. Let's bring her out, the incredibly gifted voice of Belle and one of the sweetest people on the planet, the amazing Disney legend, Paige O'Hara! She was the star who ushered in what is known as the second golden age of animation. The one that started it all by voicing a teenage mermaid who wanted to be where the people are. Now she's part of our world and also a Disney legend. It's Ariel, the phenomenal Chubby Benson. myself every day. That's right. right. <laughs> it's not like Legend Linda. Excuse me, Legend Linda. Um, I sort of like it at the end, like PhD. 
<laughs> and the Larkin legend. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome. So Jody, you've had a really, really busy couple of days, right? Tons of fun. We had tons of fun. We had our 30th anniversary celebration. Thanks for all the stuff. You great people that came out. We, we had a lot of fun. It was it was uh, it was emotional. It was exciting. I cried I probably six times at least. Um, <laughs> But just getting to share the memories with the fans, and it's all because of them, you know, that we're still, we're still kicking, we're still going. Pretty amazing. And awesome. so thankful. Did, did you have a sense, when you made Little Mermaid originally, that this, it was really going to be something special? I mean, as you're, you have to understand, at the time, this was 19, you are probably working on the film in 87, 88, and animation was just kind of for kids at the time. Like, it had kind of taken a dip down. Did, did you realize that you were really working on something truly special? We knew that things were different because we were going to the animators on Flower Street off the lot and they were off the lot and we knew that things were really changing and there was a lot of pressure that was going on. We didn't feel it personally but we could tell from everybody. Um, so my hire date is when we started, so Rick and I, we've known each other for 30 plus years and uh, it just kind of took us all by storm. We just kind of put this out there and we were completely blown away, had absolutely no idea that I'd be talking to you 32 years later about the same subject, really, honestly. We were gonna disappear, just do the voice and disappear, and roll the credits at the end, and look where we're at today, getting to celebrate all together. So, it's exciting. It's so crazy, if you were working on Beauty and the Beast, we had had the Little Mermaid preceding that. And it did really, really well. Oh, yeah. um, so did you have that same sense? You had you know, Howard and, and Alan working on the same film who did Little Mermaid. So now they're working with you on Beauty and the Peace. Oh, my gosh. Did, you, did you have a sense that something really cool was happening? I knew something really special was happening. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be a Disney princess. You know, and it's just like, <laughs> you're just like I can't, I don't want to mess this up at all, you know? But I didn't really comprehend the magnitude of Beauty and the Beast and Little Mermaid until the New York Film Festival, unfinished version that they showed, because we all know as theater people and Broadway people how tough the New York critics are. And I think Jeffrey Katzenberg and Don Hahn were about to have heart attacks that night when they, when they saw it. But, but that night, the entire New York critic audience stood up for 10 minutes after the Beauty and the Beast that night. And I think that's when we realized this is gonna be a classic. We knew then. And what was the work between the two of you working with Alan and, and Howard? Well, we both know what geniuses Alan Lincoln and Howard Ashman are. I think, and I'm sure you, you can tell with, with, with Little Mermaid, but for Beauty and the Beast, truthfully, the whole film was in the mind of Howard Ashman. He had a vision. And if we ever strayed off that vision, we always quickly came back to it because he was always right. And I think that in heaven, he saw it, and he saw his vision come to fruition. And uh, he's greatly missed, as we all know, and Alan is still going strong and writing great songs still. And Howard brought so much vision to the company, and what he came with to Disney just kind of blew everybody away. Everybody kind of stood back because he was he was a powerful and gentle force all at the same time. Sometimes intimidating. Yeah, very intimidating. But I had just worked with him as my director and Smile on Broadway. So we had a great relationship working together in the studio. But I think everybody else around was like, what is going on? But when you're in the presence of pure, unadulterated, real genius, it stops your breath. That's what it's like working with Howard. It was it was an unbelievable gift, and so grateful. So grateful. and I think it was it was great for you because you did have the Broadway show with him, so you knew him before that. It was a great relationship, and we knew how to work. And, and Ron and John, our directors, were kind enough to let Howard come in the studio. And I told you guys this this morning in the booth with me, with the guys behind the glass. They just said, Howard, do your thing, because they knew yeah. it really is Howard Ashman who brought Alan Menken in. That's what changed the face of animation forever. That's what brought our animators off of Flower Street back onto the lot, thank God. <laughs> and we're so thankful. So Linda, do you remember, Casey, okay, so, so we had the predecessors, we had Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and now there's working on this new film with, with uh, Ron and John, um, coming off of Little Mermaid, their next movie is Aladdin, and you get the call that you were the voice of Jasmine. Do you remember where you were? I do. I, I was in my apartment in North Hollywood 
I was shocked that I actually was getting this opportunity to play a Disney princess. It's something that I had done as a, as a child. I had had my read-along storybooks with all the princesses, Snow White, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty. These were, these were my princesses when I was a little girl. And I would read along with their voices, not knowing that I was practicing for something that I was going to do when I was a grown-up. <laughs> you, you had the most quintessential jasmine voice. <laughs> that, I mean, she just sounds like, oh, that's, oh hi, Rick. <laughs> uh, and so, Anika. <laughs> so, this is kind of serendipitous because I'll tell, because we asked Anika to be part of this a while ago, but she, she was in London. I'm working on a, on a project. And we just happened to see each other on Friday, this last Friday, because she made it, she came back from London early, and her management didn't think she would be back. And so I said, you know, I'm really mad at you. <laughs> she said, why? And I said, well, because we wanted you to be part of this show. You know, you're a legend. You got to do this. And she says, well, I got to do that. And so here she is. <laughs> so um, you've done a lot of Tiana projects. So kind of like, like Jody said, you know, for 30 years you've been doing this now, Prince and the Frog isn't quite as old as that. Ten. But did it, well, ten. Ten, yeah, the ten years. So um, did you think that you would continue to be living this Tiana life after the film? You know, like, so many things have happened that I wasn't really ready for. I had no idea that Tiana would be everything that she is, that she would touch people the way that she does and did. I was not a princessy kid. I wasn't a girly girl. I was in a tree. Um, <laughs> and so if I was doing voices, I was literally like, I was Les Poissons. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing Beast. When you told Beast about eating his cereal and he was still being sort of a monster. <laughs> That's what I was doing at home. <laughs> I didn't realize that it would go as far as it has. And it's been, it's been moment upon moment of surprise and gift for me. I didn't imagine that I would be a Disney legend. That, and so much so that I, when they asked me about it, I said, yeah, okay. Because I thought Tiana was being inducted. <laughs> I had no idea I was being inducted until I got there. <laughs> the youngest Disney legend to be brought in. So, uh, it's been a gift after gift after gift. After gift. And um, you know, all I want to do is, is keep doing voices. That's the thing that I love to do. That's the thing that Disney was the joy for me when I was a child. It was dancing mushrooms and talking animals and trees and things and making things part of our living world. And that was that's such a gift and it still is. So I'm really grateful to be part of it. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of sad. Um, Scott Winder was supposed to be here today, um, the voice of Aladdin. But just this morning, he had a, uh, a little bit of a family emergency. I hope everything's okay. But he couldn't be here. But Scott's got a great sense of humor about this whole Legends thing. Because um, Scott is not a legend. And <laughs> Linda is a legend. <laughs> I had to get him into the park. What's that? I had to get him into the park. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he reminds me all the time the film is called Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, he'll come on the lot and he goes past that little the little thing. If you pin on our lot, we have the uh, the bronze hands and he sees Linda's hands there and he just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but. But Linda, you, as I mentioned, you have like this, this jasmine voice, but you all have very specific voices, which is why you were cast in your roles. Um, has it ever happened where you're out in public and just talking to store clerk or something like that, and they recognize you by your voice? This happened to me on Thursday. I don't know <laughs> if he's here today, but I saw somebody at the airport at JFK in New York, 
and he was coming here to D23, and from across the way he said, are you even working? And I was like, do I know you? And he was like, you're Jasmine. I was like, I, but we know each other? He said, no, I recognize your voice. And I was like, oh, you are good. <laughs> Never had any of Absolutely. I've been in stores, I've been in the, the most random places and had people go, Tiana! <laughs> <laughs> With the arm and everything, and it's magnificent. <laughs> That's so fun. Mine was uh, with Delta Airlines uh, per pretty early on when I would call the, you know, the number and make the reservation. And it'd be like, hi, you know, I'm just checking out the flight. And she'd be like, does anybody ever tell you you sound a lot like Ariel? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, people say that a lot. <laughs> really do. And for me, it was a little boy in the grocery store. I was just yakking with my friend, and he just kind of kept clo getting closer to me and closer to me. <laughs> and then he just kind of pulled my shirt and said, are you Belle? <laughs> you are so smart. I want to adopt you, you're so cute. <laughs> It was adorable, and I thought it'd be a girl, but it was a little boy. It's kind of cool. <laughs> and Paige, you've been here um, here at D twenty three, not only as Belle, but you're doing something really special at Disney Fine Art, right? You want to tell us about yes, that? Yes, it's been so incredible. I, I've been an artist my whole life, and um, when I moved to New York at seventeen, I would paint watercolors and sell them on the street to pay my rent and everything. And I kind of went away from it for a while. And uh, when Michael was starring, my husband starring in *Fan of the Opera* in L.A., he said, you need to start painting again. And so I started doing it, and then 10 years ago, I was asked to be the voice of Belle at Rodell's event, the famous Disney artist Rodell, and, and he said, bring one of your paintings. And uh, I brought my Belle painting, because I, I would paint them for fun, you know, for my friends and stuff like that. And the painting sold that night, and Michael Young, who's president of Disney Fine Arts, said, hey, this is really good, we want to sign you. And I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe it, a whole nother career. So it's, uh, I'm loving being back here in August of um, I actually, um, I've been painting Beauty and the Beast for several years now, but I recently started um, a princess series. And my gallery, if you guys want to look it up, it's in Las Vegas, it's called Magical Memories. But I was inspired by the legend princesses that are my friends that are sitting right here. And so I'd like to give them a surprise. <laughs> Jody, my friend of 35 years, this is my aerial for you, my beautiful girlfriend. together and we hang out a lot and eat pizza and have a great time. And this is for you, Linda, your jazz man. And Rick is right, these women are his characters. And Anika, I had the great privilege to finally meet you at when we became legends together. But I've been a long time fan. And I hope that I get to work with you at some point. And I do. Okay. I would love it. This is for you, sweetheart. You're beautiful to know. Inspires everybody. What you don't know is that I saw Paige. You don't have to take him on the plane. We'll ship him to you. <laughs> I saw Paige backstage and, I, and she gave me a big hug and since the first time we met she has been one of the warmest, most welcoming people and you know this is a pretty exclusive club so it's really important when somebody reaches for you with open arms and I want you to know that this is who she is, this is not for the stage, yeah. this is this woman's That's right. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. 
shout out to Ben and yeah. Renee who brought the painting. Oh yeah, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My husband Michael who played the beast on Broadway and bringing those up. Awesome. Well, um, all four of you are such strong heroes. Um, what personality traits um, do you think you put into your character? And you could also ask, maybe, or answer the question, are there, is there anything that your character did that you would never do? <laughs> Jody? Oh, okay. Um, so the character quality, I would have to say Ariel's tenacious spirit. That's something that, that I have tried to strive for, and I feel like I brought some of that to Ariel, but I really feel like Ariel has taught that to me over the last 30 years, how to break barriers, how to live outside of the box, how to dream big, how to think outside of anything, of, of going towards the impossible, and to reach for that. So I would say her tenacious spirit. And the thing that I probably wouldn't do is, um, Pluck the flower to say he loves me and he loves me not. <laughs> I just, I never really quite connected with that. He loves me, he loves me not kind of a thing. So, yeah, that's probably the only thing. Other than that, I think Ariel and I are, you know, right on the same path. Did, did you always used to say, oh my God? <laughs> yes, I do say, oh my God. Oh my gosh, she's fantastic. Yeah. I do say that. <laughs> How about you, Paige? Oh, well. I'm the oddball, like Belle, you know, the book geek, you know, <laughs> the strange one in school when I was a kid and I was into Gar George Gershwin and all my friends were into Led Zeppelin, I was just like the oddball. So I totally identify with that. And I guess something I would never do that Belle did was fight off the wolves with a stick. <laughs> I don't think I'd be doing that. I think I'd be using my running ability and running as fast as I could. <laughs> awesome. Linda? I think what I identify with with Jasmine the most is that she stands up for who and what she believes in. And that's something that I do in my life. And Jasmine's very loyal and courageous. And those are things that I, I feel important in me too and that I strive for always. And the thing that Jasmine does that I wouldn't do ever is sing on a first date. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. And Nika? Okay. So there are a couple of traits that Tiana and I share that can be seen as really good or the other side. <laughs> um, I'm very stubborn. <laughs> And I'm not to be deterred. So. Can, can, I, can I just jump in there? Because when we're in the studio with Anika, she is very opinionated about what Tiana says and what she doesn't do. And I can't talk her in any other. It's Anika's character, trust me. That's a good thing, because awesome. I'm protecting who she is. <laughs> and. <laughs> You know, one thing that is amazing about her, and same with me, I came from a very small town. Nobody in my town was telling me that I could do the things that I'm doing. Nobody was telling me, yes, you're going to be sitting on stage as a Disney legend. And if it had not been for being really stubborn and being really bent and determined and straight with a path, I wouldn't be here. So I'm very grateful for those traits. Who live with me may not be as grateful. <laughs> um, and there are a couple of things that I would not have done. We can start with the obvious, no fraud. <laughs> um, and secondly, I don't know, and I love Naveen. He's fabulous, he's funny, he's handsome, he's a prince. Um, I don't know if I could have married a man that talks that much. <laughs> All right, now, now, Jody, you got to do something special in your movie that no other princess would be able to do, and that is to play a villain within the movie. So, and she also got to sing, so the, the villain Vanessa. So, um, what was that like? Well, basically, you know, Howard was like, you need to play Vanessa, this is what she does. Just imitate Pat, just do what Pat does. And I was like, okay. What a lovely little bride I'll make my dear, I'll look divine. 
Things are working out according to my ultimate design. <laughs> so I have that little mermaid and the ocean will be mine. kept doing her cackle. Uh, I mean, we must have done that for three hours. And then, and then I would do it, and then Kat would do it on top of me, and you know, well, not physically on top of each other. Lay, lay the voices on top of each other, and we kind of go back and forth so that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but most people don't know that I do Vanessa. Mo most people don't know that, you know. So. Any time you get to do a villain laugh is a good day. <laughs> Any villain laugh? Anytime you could be a villain, laugh like a villain, yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> it was so fun. It was so fun. We had a great time with Kat. She was such a trooper to teach me how to kind of do her cackle. So it was fun. It was That's a really fun day. Awesome. All right, well, real quick speed round. I may not be able to do a speed round on this. But as a Disney legend, what's the one thing that you'd like for your fans to take away from yours and the Disney legacy? That it is important, necessary, to dream. And that there is no dream that is too big. And whether you are in a family with two parents, one parent, no parents, maybe you don't know where they are, that does not mean that your dreams are not worthy and that you cannot make your way out of whatever circumstance you are in on the legs and wings of that dream. I think that who you are is much more important than what you are and that you need to be yourself and believe in yourself. That's what I would take away from the Disney Legacy. I think the most important message comes from the entire message of Beauty and the Beast, which is to follow your heart and always remember don't judge anything by the way it looks. Beauty truly comes from within. And that's what I'm messing with. And I think for me, for all these years, these last three decades, I just hear Howard Ashman in my head every time I'm in the studio, every time I sing Part of Your World. And what, what rings true for me is to be authentic, to be real, to be true, to be a storyteller that every single person has a story to tell, and it really matters, and that you're enough. You know, who you are is enough. You just need to be genuine and authentic from you and tell that story, because each and every one of us has a story, and they matter. And I can just constantly hear Howard in my, in my heart and in my mind every time when it comes to being part of the Disney family. So, yeah, it's a blessing. Awesome. It's a blessing. audience, but we have a really big fan backstage. Um, she is, I'm really excited to get her out here. She also happens to be one of our character voices, as well as the actress who played the princess known as the fairest of them all in ABC's Once Upon a Time. And I like to think of her as the bunny that won't take no for an answer. She's a cop. Hall of Voices, and uh, so I, I met you guys as a geeky fan then, and I am still a geeky fan, I cannot believe I'm sitting on the stage. <laughs> fan girling with you too, <laughs> trust me. I want to have pizza with y'all, I was hearing about these pizza parties. <laughs> For 
pretty awesome. So do you have a favorite? Do I, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> good answer, good answer. <laughs> So, um, so then you're a big fan, and then Judy Hopps comes along. Yes. It's pretty exciting, right? Yes. And Judy's such an aspirational character, I know that uh, we talked about the international side of things, um, and, and Zootopia went on to do, like, I think, like $150 million in China alone, which is just unheard of in that country because she's so aspirational, and, and so many people, you know, grabbed onto her. So, um, what did you know coming into the film? I know the film had different iterations, so I'm sure you brought a lot of who Judy was to that character. You want to talk about that a little bit? But like, what, what did I know about the film when I was brought into yeah, and how did, how did she evolve? Well, Judy was actually, the story wasn't about Judy when I was brought in. And by the way, I knew nothing. When I got this phone call, by the way, I was wearing Mickey Mouse pajamas, and I was <laughs> in an apartment in Canada shooting Once Upon a Time, and I had a... Been, I had been recording uh, Tinkerbell and the Legend of the Never Beast. And, thank you. And uh, we had we had changed. We had we had done a lot to change my voice and try different things. And I didn't know how well I was doing. And I had a phone message this morning in the Mickey Mouse PJs, and Prince Charming was making my eggs, and that's true. And, uh, and I had this phone message from every one of my representatives, including my voiceover agent. And whenever they're all on the phone, it's either that you've got a job or that you are being released from a job. <laughs> and I was sure because we had been working so hard on Tinkerbell and I, and I was feeling insecure and we had tried all these different things, I was sure that I was being fired. And I turned to Prince Charming, who was making the eggs, and I said, they're all on the phone, they're, they're gonna let me go. And he said, or Disney's calling, and they're gonna offer you like the lead in their next movie. I said, that's mean. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do this to me. So I braced myself and I called my reps back and they said, so Disney called. <laughs> and they would like to offer you the sidekick in Zootopia. And I said, I don't care what it is. I will pick my nose silently in the sound booth. I am it. And I said, can I see a script? And they said, it doesn't really work that way. It's going to evolve and change as you collaborate with this group of incredible people. And I said, just sign me up. I don't care what it is. So I went, I, I in, endeavored to play Judy as the faithful and sometimes combative sidekick to Nick Wilde, who was the narrator of our story originally. And I thought things were going very well, but two years into recording, I went into a session and there was an, honestly, there was a moment where they said, oh, nobody told you? And I was like, nobody told me what? And they said, you're, you're gonna be working a lot more. And they presented me with this idea that now we were gonna see the world of Zootopia through Judy's eyes. And I had to play it cool and be like, yeah, whatever. But, you know, went outside and cried and freaked out again. But anyway, so I didn't know anything going in. And, it, and I didn't even understand really what it was going to be. I don't know what your processes were, but I didn't understand at all really what it was going to be until I saw the finished product. Because the scenes change. Every couple of months I would go in and we would try something new and slightly different and try to arc the story in a different direction. And, it was only really like at the screening that I understood what Zootopia was. Yeah. Well, you're doing a good job. It's really good. It's great job. <laughs> but, but they're all great, and, it, and you all saw them in Wreck It Ralph too, right? <laughs> How fun was that to have all the different princesses? And um, so I thought what it, it would be kind of fun to do a little game called What's Her Line? And we are going to start here. So we're very specific about our dialogue at Disney Character Voice. It has to be character appropriate. But what if we mixed it up a little bit? Why not? So I'm going to ask Anika to take this bell line and give us her best Tiana for a bell line. Let's see what that sounds like. <laughs> Gaston, may I have my book, please? Well, some people use their imaginations. Gaston, you are positively primeval.
All right, and Linda, why don't you give us Jasmine doing your best Judy Hopps line? <laughs> hundred tickets? I'm not going to write a hundred tickets. I'm going to write two hundred tickets before noon. <laughs> Paige, you get to do Jasmine's evil. Here we go. Jafar, I never realized how incredibly handsome you are. You're tall, well-dressed, and your beard is so twisted. <laughs> and Jody, you are going to give us your best Tiana. Okay. Uh, as I'll do my best. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, oh no, 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 there is no way I am kissing a frog and eating a bug on the same day? Oh. <laughs> hey Jennifer, how would Judy Hopps give us that aerial line? <laughs> <laughs> if only I could make him understand. I just don't see things the way he does. I don't see how a world that makes such wonderful things could be bad. <laughs> Sometimes it just doesn't sound right. I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> One of the exciting things that we get to do every day at Disney Character Voices is to work with all these incredible actors and actresses. And with each animated film, we add to our roster of characters new dreamers who have amazing journeys and stories to tell. Um, our most recent animated full-length musical was the film Moana. So here is one of our newer members of the DC family. <laughs> Good to see you. Come and have a seat. Great. Well, Ali, you have a pretty amazing story as to how you landed this role. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. Hello. Um, so, I was a freshman in high school, and I was in school, <laughs> and I, um, my friends and I put together an audition for a nonprofit organization. We were hoping to become the entertainment of the event and like raise funds for the event and perform at the event and have like a little star moment. And we didn't get it. But the <laughs> casting director, Rachel Sutton in Hawaii, saw my audition tape with my friends, and she said, "Who's that girl in the back row, second from the left?" And I was like, "Oh, hi." And um, she asked if I wanted to audition for Moana, of which I was like, I'm pretty sure that I like, found someone already, right? It was, it was really serendipitous, but I said yes, and I got flown up, and I got to meet Ron Clements and John Musker, and also not sure, and I auditioned, and they liked me, and yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> so, you're 14 years old, right? 14 at the time. And that you had this extensive acting career in high school. I think we were talking about what you did in high school in, in your drama class. What, what were the lead roles that you played? Um, I didn't, <laughs> thanks, didn't have any. Um, I was, so production is very important, I would like to say that, because I was a person in, like, where you are, and I'd be like, I can't hear you. That's not your line, and like that was who I was. I was not really on stage. <laughs> it's truly amazing. I think she said she played the tree with no lines or something like that. Right? Yeah, <laughs> who's laughing now? Sorry. <laughs> it's awesome. And then at age 17, after the film came out, you had to perform at the Oscars. How cool was that? Great experience, right? Fun? Pardon me? Fun? Yes, sorry. You were all clapping so loud. <laughs> it was really nerve-wracking and exciting, and I, of course, had sung the song in the booth and had recorded it and had 
producers on the other side going like, good job, but now it's in front of a live audience and I was, like Meryl Streep was like, there. <laughs> and I remember being so nervous and feeling like I had to puke and everything. But it worked out okay. <laughs> You were amazing, and I remember watching the broadcast, and uh, you got whacked in the head with a flat. I did. You just kept going. You were incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, okay. So it actually, so it happened the day before in rehearsal. So I don't want to say that I wasn't rehearsed in that. We had talked about it, and we were like, "Oh, I'm sure it doesn't happen on live television," but it did. And, and I remember, like, thinking in the back of my head, I was like, it's the same guy. <laughs> so we never figured out who it was. He, he held his piece. Uh, that's so awesome. And then, and last question here before we go, go back, and I'm going to give one more with all of you. But um, you and I got to do something really special about a year ago for Hawaii. Yes, I Mention did. That? I am so grateful to have voiced Moana again, but this time redoing Moana in Olalo Hawaii, which is the Hawaiian language. We worked with the University of Hawaii. Yes, it was beautiful. I have to say, English is my first language. I learned Hawaiian through school. I am somewhat proficient in it, and I worked with so many incredible people with that university, along with relearning the music itself. And it's so difficult, and you can speak to it a little better than I can, but I mean, we had Lynn manuel Miranda and Okutai of Hawaii and Mark Manchina on our music, and the syncopation does not always work with different languages. <laughs> it was crazy to learn it, but also it just made my heart feel so warm because I knew that my cousins who go to a Hawaiian immersion school were going to learn that and put that in their curriculum. And it just, what more could I ask for? I get to to teach and, and perpetuate my culture and my language. Well, as, as we kind of wrap up here, um, this has been phenomenal, by the way, thank you so much. Um, I don't want this to be redundant to the legacy question, but if there are dreamers out there, people who want to do something, do you have any additional advice, just kind of a last word to them that you'd like to throw to them? Nika? I'm going to stick with what I said before, but I'm also going to say, never be afraid to ask for help. We don't know how to do everything. Even the things that we are good at, we can get better at. If we are free enough to ask the people around us to assist us. And sometimes people say no, and that's fine. Because in that no, you will find your yes, and you will keep moving until you find somebody who is inspired by you and wants to assist you to move on to what you want to do. advice would be to work hard to keep an open heart because you never know where this journey is going to take you. I, I totally agree with both of you guys, but I also say it's also good to rely on history. History of the art that you're pursuing. Uh, whether it's art, whether it's acting, whether it's music. Know those great artists before you and way before you. From the turn of the century, I still learned from Beatrice Lilly. These people, um, you need to know your history, but also don't be afraid to take chances. I was taught that from my acting teacher in New York, Joanne Merlin, and she said, don't be afraid to take chances. If you fail, you just get up and you, you're better the next time and you learn from it. So um, don't be afraid, guys, just go for it. Courageous, take chances. But for me right now, I think in my life, live with no regrets. Savor every single moment. Life is so incredibly precious, and you need to savor every single moment because you don't want to go later and just go with, it, with those regrets. So that's my that's my life first for me is no regrets, no regrets. We are all of the same tribe. I am saying. I would say. Study, learn everything, and then chuck it and do it your own way. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent advice I will be taking. Um, <laughs> go beyond the reef. Learn as much as you can about yourself and others as well. Go out. 
have an open mind, be willing to learn about different people and their cultures and the things that they do, and make an active approach to journeying to reach them as well. I think that's so beautiful. The world is so big. You are, you get to explore it. Do it. Thank you.